The Contract ACT 1872 Preamble Whereas it is expedient to define and amend certain parts of the law relating to contracts, it is enacted as follows. Preliminary Short Title 1. This Act may be called the Contract Act 1872 Extent Commencement It extends to the whole of Dash And it shall come into force on the first day of September 1872 Enactments repealed Nothing herein contained shall affect the provisions of any statute, act or regulation not hereby expressly repealed, nor any usage or custom of trade, nor any incident of any contract, not inconsistent with the provisions of this act. Interpretation Clause 2. In this act the following words and expressions are used in the following senses, unless a contrary intention appears from the context. Uh, when one person signifies to another his willingness to do or to abstain from doing anything with a view to obtaining the assent of that other to such act or abstinence he is said to make a proposal be when the person to whom the proposal is made signifies his assent thereto the proposal is said to be accepted a proposal when accepted becomes a promise see the person making the proposal is called the promiser and the person accepting the proposal is called the promisee do you win? at the desire of the promiser, the promisee, or any other person has done or abstained from doing, or does or abstains from doing, or promises to do or to abstain from doing something, such act or abstinence or promises, called a consideration for the promise, e every promise and every set of promises, forming the consideration for each other, is an agreement. F promises which form the consideration or part of the consideration for each other are called reciprocal promises. G. An agreement not enforceable by law is said to be void. H. An agreement enforceable by law is a contract. I. An agreement which is enforceable by law at the option of one or more of the parties thereto but not at the option of the other or others is a voidable contract. J. A contract which ceases to be enforceable by law becomes void when it ceases to be enforceable. Chapter I. Of the communication, acceptance, and revocation of proposals communication acceptance and revocation of proposals three the communication of proposals the acceptance of proposals and the revocation of proposals and acceptances respectively are deemed to be made by any act or omission of the party proposing accepting or revoking by which he intends to communicate such proposal acceptance or revocation or which has the effect of communicating it communication when complete four the communication of a proposal is complete when it comes to the knowledge of the person to whom it is made. The communication of an acceptance is complete as against the proposer when it is put in a course of transmission to him so as to be out of the power of the acceptor as against the acceptor when it comes to the knowledge of the proposer. The communication of a revocation is complete as against the person who makes it when it is put into a course of transmission to the person to whom it is made so as to be out of the power of the person who makes it as against the person to whom it is made, when it comes to his knowledge. Illustrations A. A proposes, by letter, to sell a house to be at a certain price. The communication of the proposal is complete when B receives the letter. B. B. accepts A's proposal by a letter sent by post. The communication of the acceptance is complete, as against A when the letter is posted, as against B when the letter is received by A. C. A. revokes his proposal by telegram. The revocation is complete as against A when the telegram is dispatched. It is complete as against B when B receives it. B revokes his acceptance by telegram. B's revocation is complete as against B when the telegram is dispatched and as against A when it reaches him. Revocation of proposals and acceptances. 5. A proposal may be revoked at any time before the communication of its acceptance is complete as against the proposer, but not afterwards. An acceptance may be revoked at any time before the communication of the acceptance is complete as against the acceptor, but not afterwards. Illustrations A proposes, by a letter sent by post, to sell his house to B.B. accepts the proposal by a letter sent by post. A may revoke his proposal at any time before, or at the moment when B. posts his letter of acceptance, but not afterwards. B. may revoke his acceptance at any time before or at the moment when the letter communicated it reaches a but not afterwards. Revocation how may 6. A proposal is revoked. 1. By the communication of notice of revocation by the proposer to the other party. 2. By the lapse of the time prescribed in such proposal for his acceptance. Or, 
if no time is so prescribed by the lapse, a reasonable time, without communication of the acceptance, three by the failure of the acceptor to fulfill a condition precedent to acceptance, or acceptance must be absolute, seven, in order to convert a proposal into a promise, the acceptance must, one, be absolute and unqualified, to be expressed in some usual and reasonable manner, unless the proposal prescribes the manner in which it is to be accepted. If the proposal prescribes a manner in which it is to be accepted, and the acceptance is not made in such manner, the proposer may within a reasonable time after the acceptance is communicated to him, insist that his proposal shall be accepted in the prescribed manner, and not otherwise. But if he fails to do so, he accepts the acceptance. Acceptance by performing conditions, or receiving consideration. 8. Performance of the conditions of a proposal, or the acceptance of any consideration for a reciprocal promise, which may be offered with a proposal, is an acceptance of the proposal. Promises, express, and implied. 9. And so far as the proposal, or acceptance of any promise is made in words, the promise is said to be express. And so far as such proposal, or acceptance is made otherwise than in words, the promise is said to be implied. Chapter 2 of Contracts, Voidable Contracts, and Void Agreements. What agreements are contracts? 10. All agreements are contracts if they are made by the free consent of parties competent to contract, for a lawful consideration, and with a lawful object, and are not hereby expressly declared to be void. Nothing herein contained shall affect any law in force in Bangladesh, and not hereby expressly repealed, by which any contract is required to be made in writing, or in the presence of witnesses, or any law relating to the registration of documents, who are competent to contract. 11. Every person is competent to contract who is of the age of majority according to the law to which he is subject, and who is of sound mind, and is not disqualified from contracting by any law to which he is subject. What is a sound mind for the purposes of contracting? 12. A person is said to be of sound mind for the purpose of making a contract if, at the time when he makes it, he is capable of understanding it and of forming a rational judgment as to its effect. Upon his interests, a person who is usually of unsound mind, but occasionally of sound mind, may make a contract when he is of sound mind. A person who is usually of sound mind, but occasionally of unsound mind, may not make a contract when he is of unsound mind. Illustrations. A. Eh? A patient in an asylum who is at intervals of sound mind may contract during those intervals. B. A. Sane man who is delirious from fever or who is so drunk that he cannot understand the terms of a contract or form a rational judgment as to its effect on his interests, cannot contract while such delirium or drunkenness lasts. Consent defined. 13. Two or more persons are said to consent when they agree upon the same thing in the same sense. Free consent defined. 14. Consent is said to be free when it is not caused by 1. Coercion, as defined in section 15, or 2. Undue influence, as defined in section 16, or 3. Fraud, as defined in section 17, or 4. Misrepresentation, as defined in section 18, or 5. Mistake, subject to the proof, as of sections 20, 21, and 22. Consent is said to be so caused when it would not have been given but for the existence of such coercion, undue influence, fraud, misrepresentation, or mistake. Coercion defined. 15. Coercion is the committing or threatening to commit any act forbidden by the penal code or the unlawful detaining or threatening to detain any property to the prejudice of any person whatever with the intention of causing any person to enter into an agreement. Explanation. It is immaterial whether the penal code is or is not in force in the place where the coercion is employed. Illustrations. A. On board an English ship on the high seas causes B. To enter into an agreement by an act amounting to criminal intimidation under the penal code. A. Afterwards sues B. For breach of contract at Chittagong. A. Has employed coercion, although his act is not an offense by the law of England. And although section 506 of the Penal code was not in force at the time when or place where the act was done. Undue influence defined. 16. 1. A contract is said to be induced by undue influence where the relations subsisting between the parties are such that one of the parties is in a position to dominate the will of the other and uses that position to obtain an unfair advantage over the other. 2. In particular and without prejudice to the generality of the foregoing principle, a person...
So this is a federal supplemental case, group versus Finletter. And it's real easy to see what it says. Allegations in affidavit in support of motion for temporary injunction must be considered as true for the purposes of what? Of motions in absence of counter affidavit. Don't let them dirty judges tell you otherwise. Bring this case to court with you that if they don't have an affidavit, that you should get temporary relief. I've had judges and cops give ticket after ticket after ticket because somebody stands up for their rights. And this, you can file a motion for a temporary injunction and an affidavit in support claiming that government has to prove their government because according to Title 28, Section 3002, Subsection 15, A, B, and C, the United States is merely a federal corporation. And then, in accordance with Clearfield Trust Company versus United States, 318 United States 363, it was decided that if, because governments descend to the level of a mere corporation, when commercial paper, Federal Reserve notes, or securities, checks, are used. As such, government then becomes bound by the laws which govern any corporation, which means, and this is not a commentary, this is what they said in the opinion, which means that if they intend to compel somebody to some specific performance, they must have a contract or other commercial agreement between it and the one upon whom specific performances, demands for specific performances are made. Pretty cool stuff. And guess what? According to the Constitution, Article 6, this Constitution and the laws of the United States, federal laws, which shall be made in pursuance thereof. The laws are made in pursuance of the Constitution and all treaties made or which shall be made under the authority of the United States shall be the supreme law of the land. So all these people that are telling you that the Constitution is the supreme law of the land, tell them to get bent because they forgot about the laws made in pursuance thereof and all treaties made and which shall be made. Yeah. But guess what else they don't teach you? And the judges in every state shall be bound thereby. Anything in the Constitution or laws of any state to the contrary are notwithstanding. So all their little laws that they go and talk about well this is pertinent no it's not if it's contradictory to the constitution the laws of the united states or any treaty made it's not relevant those are the supreme laws of the land next all right here we go i'm gonna teach y'all four elements of contracting these four elements are going to save your ass in any type of situation you find yourself in. It doesn't matter if it's court, if it's a felony, if it's a $100,000 collection, if it's a foreclosure. That's all we need is the four elements of contracting. And one magic word you should sign always, 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 always up. I can't emphasize that enough. Always sign without prejudice. Without prejudice, UCC 1-308, it will save your ass. It has saved my ass countless times. There's no recourse for any contract if you sign without prejudice. You get all the benefits 
none of the liability. There's no legal recourse. That contract can never be brought up in court. It has no standing because without prejudice, go read UCC 1-308. It means that you preserved all of your rights in the beginning. Therefore, none of your rights can be violated. It's like a bubble around you. It's a big ass bubble and it's an impenetrable bubble. All right, so here are the four elements of contracting. First element is very simple. It's the basics, acceptance. You have two parties or more that agree upon a certain performance in the contract. You accept it, you perform, boom, acceptance of performance. Acceptance is the first element, very easy. Second is where it gets a little tricky, conditional acceptance. That means you accept the contract upon condition of blah, 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 blah. For example, <clears throat> they say you owe them 20K. You get a bill in the mail, ABC Collections. We're getting ready to put this on your credit report, potentially take you to court, garnish your wages, whatever. This letter, and I'm giving it to you for free, and it can be literally this short. You say, I conditionally accept your offer upon proof of claim that you can provide the original charging instrument for this account. Pursuant to the Uniform Commercial Code, you must be the holder in due course of the original charging instrument, otherwise you may not make a presentment. If you provide the original charging instrument, I will gladly pay the $20,000. Also, I conditionally accept your offer upon proof of claim you provide the 1099 OID that shows who the recipient of the funds are and who the issuer of the funds are because it is to my knowledge that I am the issuer of said funds. Yours truly, sovereign man. Sign it without prejudice, get it notarized, send it off certified mail, return receipt or registered mail. I like registered mail. Make sure you put your name on the right side Sign it on the bottom at the right side, the creditor side, the left side, the debtor side. And just wait for a response. You won't get one. They won't respond back. And if they do, I'll tell you what to do later. But this is not about that. So second element of contracting is conditional acceptance. That's how it works. The third element of contracting is refusal. If you refuse something, it is acceptance. Do not ever refuse a contract, especially if it is pertaining to damaging your credit or hindering your freedom. Anything like that, don't ever refuse it because it is acceptance. To refuse is to accept it, okay? If you want to refuse it, here's how you do it. You rescission it. If you want to refuse a contract, you rescission it. 12 CFR 226.15 gives you the right of rescission, 72 hour right of rescission. You have to rescission it within 72 hours. That is key. So I've gotten a lot of free shit just from rescissioning things. For example, I have a $75,000 vehicle, a GLS 550, Mercedes that I was supposed to be paying $1,500 a month on. And what did I do? I went and got the loan. And when you get the loan, you know that it is paid for. If you've been on this journey, as long as I have, you know that when you go and get a loan or you get a credit card or you receive some sort of money from a financial institution, the loan is already paid for. They didn't lend you any money. It came from your SESTA QV trust, from your master account. They're literally the middleman. They're the transfer agent, and they're creating a security agreement in between the transaction to make themselves profitable, to create investment vehicles and make more money off of the money that you already generated. So when you know this, you go get the loan, and then you rescission the loan as soon as you get it. 12 CFR 226.15 gives them 21 days to come pick up the asset. If they don't pick it up within 21 days or make a reasonable attempt, they have forfeited the asset. 
forfeiture means it's yours. So what did I do? I went and got the loan. I rescissioned it within 72 hours. They never responded. What I will say is they did respond, but they have no proof that they responded because being the fine contracting beast that I am, I incorporate my tracking numbers on all of my letters. So I have the return receipt. I have the tracking number that's on that return receipt on the letter that I sent them. And the letter was notarized and signed without prejudice, just like my contract was when I first got it. When I got the loan, the loan was signed without con without prejudice. So number one, they have no recourse. Number two, I rescissioned it. And number three, I have proof of the rescission because it was witnessed by a notary republic. It was identified with a unique tracking number stamped on the contract, the letter that I sent them, the rescission. And that is my proof that they received it. Because if you send something certified mail return receipt, but the tracking number isn't on the letter that you sent to that entity, whoever it is, you have no proof that that was what you actually sent them. It could be a bag of dog shit you sent them, but you would never know because there's no tracking number on the bag. So if you put the tracking number on the letter, this is detrimental to success, detrimental, because then you can go and reference that number in any other letter that you send them. Like, hey, three months ago, I sent you this letter. Here's the tracking number that you did accept and receive. You picked it up on said date, said person signed for it. And it specifically states in that letter that if you don't pick up the asset in 21 days pursuant to 12 CFR 226.15, that you forfeit the asset, you received it, you accepted it, you didn't respond, you didn't make a reasonable attempt, therefore there's forfeiture, therefore I have leaned the car. The vehicle is now mine. If you don't release the title, here's a $2 million bill that you must pay because you agreed to pay it in my fucking letter. Turn back on light. Let there be light. So, the third element, like I said, is a refusal. If you refuse, you accept. And if you want to refuse something, you properly refuse it through rescissions. Fourth element of contracting is silence. They say silence is golden. When it comes to peace and spirituality, it is. But when it comes to contracting, that shit will fuck you up. Never be silent. For example, if someone sends you a letter, you better not not respond or not say nothing if you don't say anything that is silence they send you a second letter they send you a third letter they have followed the due process and now you are in default and they have legal recourse to lean you to file charges against you to put a collection on your credit report to pursue you so you never remain silent you have to follow the other three elements acceptance, conditional acceptance, refusal, if you refuse to do a rescission, but never remain silent because those four things are the elements of contracting, all right? Now, remember, please, please, please sign everything without prejudice. It will save you in so many situations. I have literally saved myself hundreds and hundreds of thousands, probably close to millions of dollars just by signing things without prejudice. If you have any questions, drop them in the comments. Let's talk about it. Okay, everybody, the United States Treasury, right there is their address. Yes, that is the real address. This is their EIN. Yes, that is their real EIN. Your social security number. Your beneficiary name, first, dash, middle, colon, last, comma, beneficiary. That's important. Your address, your city, town, state. Do not abbreviate your state. Spell it out. Your own reference number, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, whatever number you want to put. The amount you're asking for, the amount the property's worth. I'm being told this needs to be slightly higher than this. A description of the property, like I said before in the video, plat X, Y, Z in this blah, blah, blah. Here's the address. It's a car or whatever. Okay? Don't forget, flip it over. Just the first copy, because there's three. Flip the first copy over and sign the back with your beneficiary signature. First, dash, middle, colon, last, comma, beneficiary. There you go. Seven actual cash value. 
Actual cash value means the cash price you can sell an item for in the ordinary course of business without being forced to sell it. When you apply for a $100,000 bank loan, you sign a $100,000 promissory note. The note funds the $100,000 bank loan check back to you. What is the actual cash value of the promissory note? It is $100,000 because the bank sells it at the end of the day for $100,000 in government bonds, which has value equal to cash. What is the actual cash value of the new bank loan check? It is $100,000 because you can receive $100,000 cash. They merely exchanged actual cash value for actual cash value and charged you as if there was a loan. Some of you may want proof. Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco Publication Monetary Policy in the United States, page 13, states that bank loans is funded by banks creating new deposits. They claim there was a loan. The truth is, it was an exchange and they called the exchange a loan. The proof is in the bookkeeping entries. No actual cash value was loaned as consideration to obtain the promissory note. And the proof is that the note funded the check. The proof that the note funded the check is the new money, the new deposit, as the Fed public had so clearly admit. If you gave the bank $100 cash as collateral for a bank loan, and the bank loaned you nothing but deposited the $100 cash and used it to fund a bank loan check, refusing to return the $100 cash collateral. Would you be mad? That is exactly what the bank did to you. When you hand the promissory note to the bank, it has equal value to the bank loan check. After the loan is repaid, the promissory note has no value because the loan payment stopped. When they return the note, it has no value, which is the same as refusing to return the $100 cash collateral. If we follow the constitution and only use gold and silver as lawful money, the bank could never use your promissory note to fund the bank loan check. The bank would be forced to use other depositors' money to fund the check giving you equal protection under the law. This is why the bank first hate the Constitution, gold, and silver money, and equal protection. Next time the media claims a group is anti-government, I bet that group believes in the Constitution and in gold and silver. You are receiving the training of a bank expert witness. Volume 2 will significantly increase your skills. Volume 1 is the basics to get everyone up to the same level. Volume 2 is the banker's nightmare. The banks know they cannot answer the following case shines without exposing everything. Ask the banker to give his personal opinion on the following questions. If the bank demands I place $10,000 cash as security with the bank to receive a $10,000 loan and the bank deposits the $10,000 into a checking account, did the bank loan anything so far? No. If the bank deposits the $10,000 to issue a $10,000 check from the deposit and returns the $10,000 check to me, did the bank loan me anything? No. Did the promissory note or lien act like security for the alleged loan? Yes. If I deposit $10,000 cash into a checking account, does the checking AC account balance increase by $10,000? Yes. Does the $10,000 cash deposited and the new checking account balance of $10,000 mean there is now $20,000 of money that can be spent? No. The $10,000 cash is exchanged for new money called checkbook money. You may spend the checkbook money by using a check, or you may exchange the checkbook money back into cash. We ask the question to prevent the bank from claiming they can create checkbook money without first depositing an asset, money, having equal value to the new checkbook money created. Checkbook money has equal value to legal tender. Cash, just like a promissory note, has equal value to cash because you can sell it for cash. Depositing cash, a check or a promissory note lien security merely means that one exchange the value of the funds deposited for equal value of checkbook money. An exchange of equal value is not a loan. $10,000 checking account balance act like new $10,000 of currency one can't spend. Mr. Banker, please answer the following questions. If one deposits the $10,000 promissory note lien, does the checking account balance increase by $10,000? Yes. Does the new $10,000 checking account balance act like new $10,000 of currency one can't spend? Yes. If the bank deposits a $10,000 prom isory note, does the bank receive the promissory note for free and create $10,000 of new money in the same transaction? Yes. Does this have an economic effect similar to stealing the $10,000 promissory note or future wages and counterfeiting rolled into one transaction? Yes. What right does the bank have to take $10,000 of actual cash value from a customer, deposit it and withdraw the money, and the bank keep the $10,000 as the bank's property without the customer's knowledge, authorization, or permission? None. The book will prove this is the situation us in the Federal Reserve Bank publications. Do you see why the bankers and government leaders fear this book? If this book got into enough Americans' hands, the leaders would be forced to follow the Constitution and great American presidents like Lynn Cohen, setting all Americans free of bank loans. The average American wife would have the option to stop working, stay home, and have the same standard of living produced with both husband and wife working today. If you keep giving your $10,000 worth of future wages to the banker for free, and they return it back to you as a loan, both spouses must work to sub. Port the Banking Welfare Ten. More and more professionals joining to save America. A true story. Jeff, a California CPA, asked me to train him as an expert witness. I had him listen to my 15 hours of cassette tapes and read my manual. I then flew to Los Angeles and met him at a friend's house. I spent hours writing on a chalkboard, explaining the bank loan agreement. The best way to teach him the concepts was to hold him up trial. I asked Jeff to pretend he was the bank president or CPA expert witness on the witness stand. As an expert witness, you must know everything about 63. America's hope to cancel bank loans without going to court. Banking. You cannot claim you do not know an answer to a question in the area you are testifying in. I asked Jeff. Do you know the Federal Reserve Bank policies and procedures regarding loans, deposits, and bookkeeping entries? He said he did. Is a bank liability a banker's debt? I asked. 
He said yes. Do banks charge interest for the use of borrowed money? Yes, they do, he said. Is this a $100,000 promissory note? I said hypothetically, holding up a piece of paper. He said yes. If the bank refused to loan the borrower a $100,000 check as consideration for the promissory note, do you believe the bank would legally own the promissory note? He said, if the bank refused to loan the money, the bank does not legally own the promissory note. Does a bank liability mean the bank owes legal tender? He responded, yes. Is the check money or merely an order to pay money? He responded, it is not money. The Uniform Commercial Code says it is not money. It acts like money with the assumption that there is legal tender deposited to make the check valid. Is it your assumption that the bank followed the Federal Reserve Bank policies and procedures? He said if they didn't, would go to jail. Is it your opinion that the bank legally owns the promissory note? He said yes. I said, Jeff, if this were a real court case, I think you would be headed to jail. At the very least, you would have lost the case. He asked me what the problem was. I explained that the check could never be the consideration loan for the promissory note. If the check was the consideration loan, then there was no cash or asset behind the check, making the check illegal. The Fed publication state that the bank never loans other depositors money or legal tender as consideration for the promissory note. According to the Fed publications, the promissory note is used as the value to fund the check. If the promissory note funded the check, then the check could never be the consideration loan because the bank. 64. America's hope to cancel bank loans without going to court. Own the promissory note without loaning one cent of legal tender. Which came first, the chicken or the egg? The question is, did the bank steal the promissory note or record it as a loan from the borrower to fund the check? Did they then lie and claim the check was the consideration loan to obtain the promissory note? Key lesson. Most non-bankers believe the bank will keep an interest were the opposite of what the agreement actually was. There is no agreement without mutual understanding. Did the agreement imply a loan of the bank's money to the borrower or a loan of the borrower's money to the borrower? The banker does not want to answer which came first, the chicken or the egg. Jeff asks me what if the bank sold the promissory note. Was the promissory note stolen? Look up the words receipt of stolen goods and property, and I think you will agree that the one who bought the promissory note understood the bank policy, standard bookkeeping entries, and agreement. They had knowledge and intent. Buying a car you know was stolen makes you guilty. As judge and jury, you must decide if the acquisition of the promissory note is receipt of stolen goods or property. Stealing is defined as obtaining another's property through a trick, a dishonest act without authorization or permission given, larceny, embezzlement, false pretense, or other wrongful acquisitions. Larceny is defined as obtaining property by unauthorized means through fraud, false representation, intentional perversion of the truth, deception with intent, or preconceived plan to convert or steal. Larceny by fraud or deception is defined as obtaining property by deception, using or creating a false impression, and or reinforcing a false impression, or preventing one from obtaining the correct information that may alter the transaction. The deceiver fails to correct the misleading information, which he previously created. Example, the bank claimed there was a loan when there was only an exchange of equal value, and then they charged you as if they loaned you their money. The deception changed the cost and the risk of the transaction. Through this trick, the banks could obtain nearly 65. America's hope to cancel bank loans without going to court. All the property in the nation for free. Judges and attorneys have routinely refused evidence into court. Larceny by fraud, extra shine, and concealment are committed when a court prevents one from bringing evidence into court for one's defense. The lawyer reinforces a false statement, claiming there was a loan, concealing that the bank took actual cash value from us, returned it back to us, and claimed it was a loan from the bank, and not return the unauthorized loan from us to the bank. Please look up the words conspiracy and white collar crime as well. The bank told you that you received a check you can cash for legal tender, and that the check was the loan allowing you to buy the house or car. All one has to do is follow the money. Tear L. Bakapin trees to see that this is not the case. 12. What is money in America? Most people know that gold and silver is lawful money in the United States according to our founding fathers and the U.S. Mer. 68 America's hope to cancel bank loans without going to court constitutional. Could not lawfully redefine money without an amendment to the U.S. Constitution. I can argue that Federal Reserve notes are not legal nor lawful using the law and court cases. I would have to write another book to present the EV. Dense, however, for the purposes of teaching you the real bank loan agreement we will call Federal Reserve Notes legal tender. It would take too long to explain how Congress passed bills taking away gold and silver and substituting them with Federal Reserve Notes. It suffices to say that they did it. Instead of the government creating the money, the banks created it. How did the banks create money? The Federal Reserve Bank of Richmond publication, Your Money, says Federal Reserve Banks pay 2.5 cents for each note produced by the Bureau of Engraving and Printing, page 12. The bank buys $100 of cash for 2.5 cents, making a profit of $99.975. The Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago publication, Two Faces of Debt, says, Federal Reserve Notes are liabilities, page 4. A liability is a bank debt or an IOU. Rockefeller got the money for free or for the cost of printing the money. This is how Rockefeller got so rich. He was a smart man. The bank his family owns creates money. No wealth is produced. It is simply shifted out of your pocket and put into the bank's pocket. The bank gives back some of it to get the Congress, judges, and sheriffs elected, ensuring more laws are passed and enforced in favor of the banks. Greed and the love of money run this country. According to court cases years ago, judges would have ruled that Federal Reserve Notes are not lawful money. What did the bank do? They simply redefined the word money and made the definition mean the opposite of what lawful money used to be. Gold and silver are assets and could never be liabilities. Years ago you could exchange a Federal Reserve note for gold or silver, but not today. Today if you ask the bank to give you real money for a $10 Federal Reserve note, they give you back $10 Federal Reserve notes. A Federal Reserve note is the apple side of gold or silver asset. The paper money is a bank liability for the real money. It is a bank IOU. For every dollar the banks print, the non-bankers are forced into one more dollar of debt when the banks more money and interest. It is like the banks. 69. America's hope to cancel bank loans without going to court, printing money, and for every dollar they print, 
They buy something while having you repay the bank principal and interest on the money they created. The banks cannot lose. The Federal Reserve Bank publications simply redefined money to mean the opposite of what the traditional meaning was. A simple illustration, years ago cash was scarce. So people used horses like currency they bartered. The bank had a better idea. Instead of using a horse as currency, the people gave the bank a $500 horse, and the bank created 500 tokens worth $1 each. The bank received the horse for free by creating 500 new tokens and giving you the new tokens. People used the tokens as money instead of using horses like money. Tokens are really bank notes on cash. Tokens became checkbook money. Checkbook money stopped people from stealing cash. For safety reasons and out of convenience, people used checkbook money for large transactions and cash for small purchases. The bank simply expanded its operations by exchanging newly created tokens for matching amounts of promissory notes that can be sold for cash. Casinos force you to use cash or tokens. Liabilities is money, and the banks force you to use cash or checkbook money. Liability is currency, thereby forking in private monopoly money upon the citizens. The people did not see the banking secret. When the bank created new tokens and exchanged the tokens for horses, the bank ended up owning all the horses for free. It was so profit able that the bank expanded their operation, exchanging nearly anything of value for newly created tokens. Soon the bank owned nearly everything. They learned that counterfeiting works better than outright stealing. Key lesson, any asset farms, ranches, cattle, gunpowder houses, cars, cash, promissory notes, liens on houses, gold, silver, diamonds, or anything else of value can be bartered and traded just like money. A bank token by itself has no value. The proof is that no one will accept a check, liability token, that cannot be cashed. The bank must receive an asset from us for free that has equal value to cash and can be quickly sold for cash to match the newly created bank tokens. Liability so that. 70. America's hope to cancel bank loans without going to court. People will accept the token as money. The banking monopoly forces the token as a medium of exchange by only accepting cash and tokens to be deposited unless one deposits promissory notes and the currency created by the deposit is returned to the depositor as loan. The Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago publication Modern Money Mechanics, page 2 uses the logic that if people use tokens in place of cash, then only cash and tokens need be considered money. The Federal Reserve Bank is wrong, and here is the proof. Cash is an asset. Tokens are bank liabilities representing the value of the matching asset earlier deposited, creating the token. Checkbook money. The token is the substitute for the earlier deposited asset. The asset gives the token value. So the correct conclusion is that only assets are money and liabilities represent a substitute of the asset earlier deposited. The bankers have a secret. If you deposit cash, asset, the cash becomes the bank's property and they owe you back an equal amount of cash or checks. If you deposit a promissory note, asset, it becomes the banker's property just like depositing cash. The banks know you cannot create new deposits, liabilities, tokens, IOUs, checkbook money without first depositing or loaning e-bank an asset, cash, check, promissory note to create the bark liability, checkbook money. This bank liability becomes a token substitute for the real money, which is a bank asset. They deposit your money, promissory note, asset, and they keep the money, asset. They use your money to create a matching amount of private bank money, liability. They then return your deposit back to yo you as if they loaned you other people's money, hoping you do not find out that they loaned you your own money. The proof is in Modern Money Mechanics, page 2. Just as a token is a casino liability, checkbook money is a bank liability. The publication states, this is a transaction concept of money it then lists demand deposit bank liability tokens, and other checkable deposits, bank liability tokens, as money. The next page explains that banks learned how they could create money tokens by exchanging a borrower's promissory notes for newly created bank notes, bank liabilities tokens, and loaning. 71. America's hope to cancel bank loans without going to court. The bank notes back to the alleged borrower as money. In this way, banks began to create money. The next paragraph states, transaction deposits are the modern counterpart of bank notes. Remember, a transaction deposit is a checking account balance, bank liability token. Then it explains how issuing a bank note is like making a bank bookkeeping entry that creates a deposit, bank liability token. For a borrower, which can be spent by writing a check. The check merely transfers the funds, tokens from your checking account to another checking AAC account. Both the deposit and bank note are bank liabilities used as private bank money tokens. The bank liability is spent like money and is used in place of cash. To use private bank money like cash, one first deposits cash, asset, or a promissory note, asset having actual cash value. The asset is exchanged for a token, liability, or checkbook money, liability when the cash. Every dollar deposited is matched with a new bank liability or token. Now the depositor spends the token like money because the real money was exchanged for a substitute liability token. No one will use the token as money without first depositing it an asset so one can cash the check. The token is dependent on cash behind it if it is to be used as money thus proving the real money is a bank asset, cash, and not a liability token. Creating new money proves that they did not loan you other depositors money. A token is not legal tender because it is owing cash, which is the opposite of cash. Modern Money Mechanics gives the details explaining that the bank did not loan you other depositors money. Richmond Federal Reserve Bank Public Assurance your money and our money claim that demand deposits, travelers checks, and interest bearing accounts are not legal tender. Even though they are usually accepted in payment for purchases for goods and services, these publications admit that they loan you a bank liability called a demand deposit or checkbook balance traded by check. Modern Money Mechanics explains how the promissory note is exchanged for credits in the borrower's transaction AC counts, thereby creating new money. The new money is then given back to the alleged borrower as a bank loan. Your money and our money claim that the loan in fact becomes new D72. America's hope to cancel bank loans without going to court. Posit Money Federal Reserve Bank of New York publication I bet you thought states Commercial banks create checkbook money whenever they grant a loan, then it gives the details on how the bank exchanges a promissory note for a newly created deposit and the new deposit becomes new money. The publication then explains that checks are not money, 
They simply transfer bank liabilities tokens from one checking account to another checking account. They are simply order forms to move transaction balances that banks want tokens as money because the borrower will not know if the tokens loan came from other depositors, LIBOR, or if the bank exchanged your promissory note. Newly created tokens, loaning your own labor money back to you. If everyone only used cash as money issued interest free by the government, the bank could only loan other depositors money. By exchanging the promissory note for tokens, new money is created. The bank received money or actual cash value for free from the alleged borrower and returned an equal amount of actual cash value back to the same borrower as a bank loan. The economic effect of stealing and counterfeiting could be stopped if we all stopped using credit cards and checkbook money. This is why the bankers are pushing for a cashless society where only checkbook money is used, giving the bank obsolete control over you. I know of no other business like this. The borrower hands you $100,000. You hand the $100,000 back as a loan. The borrower repays the $100,000 plus interest. We should all become bankers, judges, police, or lawmakers in order to benefit from this system, or hire legal counsel to give us equal protection, or vote out anyone aiding and abetting the bankers. The bankers do not fear you suing them if they can control the judges. They fear an informed populace agreeing that our founding fathers' constitution prohibits such a banking system. We can never vote out the politicians aiding the bankers until we can't get enough brochures and cassette tapes copied and distributed and people reading this book. We need informed voters to correct the problem. Whoever owns or controls the media controls the 73. America's hope to cancel bank loans without going to court. Money and the government. Our brochures, tapes, and this book will become our media to expose the ugly truth about our banking problem. Conclusion. Any asset is money. A car, house, cash, promissory note, lean on a car, or house, anything that has value that you own and can trade is money. The banks created a monopoly, forcing you to transfer your assets to the bank for free. The bank gives you back an equal amount of private bank tokens representing the value of the asset. The bank then only accept cash or tokens as money, forcing private bank liabilities, IOUs tokens to be used as a substitute in place of the real money, a car, house, or promissory note. In the process, the bank obtains the nation's assets for free through money creation. Then the bank loans us back the substitute money, liability representing the money the bank just took from us. The Constitution our founding fathers gave us gives us equal protection and gold and silver currency and prohibits credit, bank tokens, liabilities, IOUs. The citizens are not forced to transfer their assets to the bank for free to obtain money. One cannot redefine the constitutional definition of money, I gold, and silver coin, asset, without an amendment to the Constitution or a constitutional convention. The Constitution demands equal protection, prohibiting two classes of citizens. Our founding father's constitution prohib is those who can legally transfer wealth from your pocket into theirs, use it to create money, and loan it back to you. In the future, informed voters will decide if the bankers are right or if our founding fathers were correct. Our job is to tell everyone what the real bank loan agreement is. The bankers know they must conceal the truth. I talk to bankers who redefine words and call checks cash because you can get cash for the check. We know that the check merely transfers money previously deposited. The banks claim that they do not steal nor counterfeit. They redefine it and call it good business or monetizing. Monetize means to make into money. They made the asset, house, promissory note, cash into checkbook money tokens by matching the value of the asset with new tokens. The economic effect is similar to ceiling and 74. America's hope to cancel bank loans without going to court. Counterfeiting but monetize sounds legal. Redefining words does not change the economic effect of the transaction. Someone still transferred an asset from one party to another without the authorization of the one who lost them. 9. Bank Auditor from Texas. True story. A radio station in Texas invited me to speak about bank loans. After I spoke, a man called identifying himself as a former CPA bank auditor. He told me he always knew that something was wrong, but could never quite put his finger on it. In a matter of minutes, I explained how I felt. The bank auditor was concerned that he could go to jail. I suggested we do some role playing, as if we were in court. I told him to pretend he was on the witness stand. I said, do you have the competence to conduct the bank audit? He said yes. He admitted that under CPA ethics he had no choice but to say yes. I asked, did you determine at the bank legally? On the promissory note, he said, yes, that this is part of the audit requirement. 61. America's hope to cancel bank loans without going to court. I asked him, on a $100,000 bank loan, how much legal tender must the bank loan in order for the bank to legally own the $100,000 promissory note? He responded that it would have to loan $100,000 anew. had just made a fatal mistake. I asked, what does a $100,000 bank liability mean? He said it means the bank owes $100,000 of legal tender. I asked him if a check is money or merely in order to pay money. He gave the standard reply, stating the check is the same as money because you can redeem it in cash. I asked him if, according to the Uniform Commercial Code, it is money or merely in order to pay money. He said, don't worry about it. I said, do you have the competence to answer the case? Cheyenne, I knew he could not say no if he took on a CPA bank audit assignment. He finally confessed that it is not money, it is merely in order to pay money. I asked, according to the standard bank bookkeeping on tries and according to the Federal Reserve Bank policy and procedures, who provided the original capital to fund the bank loan? Check. Was it the bank or the borrower? He said, if I answered that question, I might go to jail. He admitted the check and liability is not money. He admitted the bank must loan $100,000 of legal tender to the borrower in order for the bank to legally own the promissory note. That means the promissory note cannot fund the bank loan check. He became very upset and concerned. He explained that if the bank does not legally own the promissory note, then the audit was incorrect and must be changed. If this were done, it would open the door for a lawsuit. He very well might go to jail. The next day he called me claiming he found a weakness in my argument and charging that the banking procedure was not check kiting. I asked him if the word loan meant money advanced to a borrower to be repaid at a later date, usually with interest. He said yes. He had no choice. He had to say yes. This definition comes from the dictionary. 62. America's hope 
to cancel bank loans without going to court. I asked him if the bank records legal tender as a bank asset. He said yes. This refuted his claim that the local banks have a license to create the opposite of legal tender, bank liability called checkbook money owing legal tender, and loan the opposite of legal tender to the borrower. I asked him if it is standard policy for the banks to record promissory notes as a loan from the borrower to the bank. Obviously, the answer is yes. He knew I had the Federal Reserve Bank publications show in the standard bank bookkeeping entries, which recorded the promissory note as a bank asset offset by a new bank liability. This is economically the same as loaning the promissory note to the bank and the bank loaning the value back to you. He knew that. If it is material... So to answer that question, I'm going to take you to Jerome Daly versus First National Bank of Montgomery in the state of Minnesota. This went to the Supreme Court. Now, let me explain to you what happens when you go apply for a loan. Say I want $100,000. They type that up on their books as a credit for $100,000, right? They then debit your account $100,000. So positive $100,000, negative $100,000. The books are closed. You see how that is done? The books are closed. But no, what they do then is in order for you to access that money, make you write a check for $100,000. So you've just given them $100,000. They're up $100,000. And then on top of you just giving them up $100,000, you've created a $100,000 credit. So there was a $100,000 credit. Then there was a debit. So the balances were zero. But then you gave them another credit of $100,000. And then on top of that, they charge you interest. And you pay them another $100,000. So they have just made a cool profit without ever putting up anything of their own. Now let's look at the case text. Defendant appeared and answered that the plaintiff, the plaintiff is the bank, created the money and credit upon its own books by bookkeeping entry as the consideration of the note. And then scroll down to where it says it is hereby ordered and decreed that because of the failure of lawful consideration, the note and the mortgage are null and void. So... He proved in a court of law, this is one of many court cases like this, that the bank is not losing any money. They're not losing any money. People want to say, ah, oh, well, they have to make money off the interest. No, they could take 5% of the credit they just arranged in your name and make a profit. But no, what they do is they keep the entire amount, fraud you into paying them double. But again, this is just one of many court cases that prove that money is not real. There is no consideration, right? They got the money from you because we haven't had money since 1933 on the gold standard. What money did they actually loan you? They didn't. They typed it up on their computer. There is no loss for them. That's why they can't take anything from you. Hey everyone, so thank you so much. I'm just gonna get into this really quick. My name is Megan Monroe. I am a trustee on Cotipico Aotearoa, the sovereign bank of Aotearoa. Um, Aotearoa is New Zealand and I work with the Maori indigenous nation there. Um, if you guys didn't know, the Maori and New Zealand's colonial country are currently co-governance to the land that is Aotearoa. And uh, we'll get into that in a second because it totally relates to the fact that you, as your, as a mother or father, if you're watching this, when you guys have your children, um, that is your, essentially that is an asset or property to your estate. And if you do not take the certificated security, which is the birth certificate, and file that into your private estate within two weeks of that child being born, you abandon, forfeit, or give up your rights to be the uh, owner of that. And then... You know, they think this is a bad thing, but it's really the United States is just taking that document and it's filing it away because it didn't, okay? So it's not like the government's like evil. I'm not gonna talk about that right now, but what it is is that we are ignorant. We were not taught by our parents, right? Most of us are not in the one to 3% of people who know about having a trust and we don't understand that we are trust fund babies as well, okay? We are the beneficiaries of the trust that is the United States of America, but we have to understand how to have a relationship with that trust. And the way that we live right now as we live as a implied trust or uh, an implied beneficiary of this trust, we have not expressed that we have our own trust and we don't have our own estate structured properly in order to hold all of our assets. So your cars, your houses, your boats, your babies, you do not own them until you understand how to do this process. Now, this process is not some mystical thing that people don't know how to do. This is what people in my realm every day are doing. This is how we operate as in a trust to trust society. But you guys need to understand that this information has been withheld from you and I sit here and like my video says and I try and share with people and they look at me like I'm an alien and I get it 
it, I am not someone who came from a privileged background. I am someone who has had to fight my way to earning my wealth, earning my relationships, um, and being able to talk and understand that our language is deceptive and it is what true babble is. And so don't feel like you're dumb or like you don't have an understanding of what it is that I'm sharing or what people like me are talking about because it is not something that was taught to you when it should have been. You were taught and conditioned to uphold the trust that is the United States of America. But now it is time for you to take the initiative and learn how to uphold the trust that is you and your estate. Okay, and that starts with the certification. Okay, so I'm going to read to you something that was sent to me a few months ago and it's definitely super interesting don't fucking come for me i didn't write this but whatever you believe keep that near and dear to your heart i think yeah your heart's over here keep that near and dear to your heart here we go 40 well-kept secrets that all u.s slaves should be aware of yes i'd said slaves do with that what you will one the Revolutionary War was fraud. The United States did not actually de declare independence from Great Britain or the King. Two, America is a British colony. Three, the King of England financed both sides of the Revolutionary War. Four, the gold fringe, symbolic of royalty, which is attached to the border of every U.S. flag hanging in every courtroom across America, symbolizes America being ruled to this day by Great Britain under international maritime admiralty law five there are no judicial courts in america and there have not been any since 1789 judges do not enforce states statutes and codes executive administrators enforce statutes and codes six there have not been any judges in america since 1789 there have only been administrators seven the most powerful court in America is not the United States Supreme Court, but is the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania. Eight, if you are legal age and retain uh, legal counsel in your defense, you are automatically assumed by the court to be mentally incompetent ward of the court and can therefore be remanded indefinitely to any mental institution of the court's choosing. Nine. You cannot use the U.S. Constitution to defend yourself because you are not a party to it. 10. The people does not include you and I. 11. You own no property. Read the deed to the property you think is yours. You are listed as a tenant. Legally, the term being refers to an animal impersonating person is underlined. A human, such as a slave. Under the law, slaves cannot own property. 12. We are slaves and own absolutely nothing, not even what we think are our children. Read your birth certificate. Your mother is listed as an informant. 13. George Washington divided st states into districts based upon ritualistic practice of dissecting Masonic squares. This is why even today so many towns are built on the square. America truly is the land of the free. Freemasons, that is. Hey, did you know that no one can lawfully be tried or convicted of any statutory crime? So to avoid prosecution under the trust, when one is taking before a corporate prosecuting attorney or judge first, <laughs> one must inquire if we are on the record and if not, assist upon it. Say nothing, sign nothing, and answer no questions until you are convinced that the proceedings are being recorded. Secondly, all one has to say for the record is, I am the beneficiary of the trust, and I am appointing you as my trustee. Thirdly, one then directs his trustee to do his bidding. As my trustee, I want you to discharge this matter. I am accused of and eliminate the record. Fourthly, if one suffered any damages, as a result of his arrest, he can direct 
that the trust compensate him from the proceeds of the court by saying, I wish to be compensated for XYZ dollars in redemption. Now, this statement is sufficient to remove the authority and jurisdiction from any prosecuting attorney or judge. Hmm. It doesn't matter what the action involves or how it is classified by the corporate law as a civil or criminal action. It works most of the time, if not every time. Did you know those facts? Okay, so we have the UCC connection. I've had this book for a while. Um, it's always good to like, you know, refresh your brain and stuff, but this back page, um, full circle. So we're gonna read it. Special stuff you should know. Taking your birth certificate to court. The courts only want to charge some bogus bonds to your federal account and they need your bond or permission to do the discharge. Otherwise, you must pay a fine and go to jail. But they neglected to tell us that the birth certificate is a bond and the birth certificate is proof that we are the beneficiary and not the trustee of our straw man trust account. The state is the trustee. Everything including crimes and taxes is already prepaid through the birth certificate bond. In every case so far, the charges were settled and they let the fellow go without a record of crime by surrendering the birth certificate. Further, the birth certificate proves that you are the beneficiary of your straw man estate. The prosecutor is claiming that he represents the beneficiary when the state is really supposed to be the trustee. So when you bring your birth certificate into court, you discharge all of the charges against you and you prove that you are the beneficiary of your trust estate. And this completely shuts the prosecutor down. The prosecutor now has no standing. You bringing in the birth, cert birth certificate proves that he has brought fraud into the court by claiming to be the beneficiary instead of you. Only the beneficiary, who is you, can be the plaintiff. And only the trustee, the state, can be the defendant. I do not give legal advice, but this is what I would do if I were in your shoes. How to proceed. One, take a certified copy of your birth certificate, which is certified by the state, to court with you. Do not take a copy or it will be void and do not have any markings on it or it will be void. Two, write down what you're gonna say because you can be nervous and forgetful. Three, when they call your name, walk up to the bar, but do not cross it. If it is a court of record, ask them, are we on record? Once you are so satisfied you're on the record, you can proceed. If they ask your name, ask again, are we on record? Four, hand the birth certificate across the bar and say, I am here on special appearance. Let the record show that the person and the birth certificate has been surrendered to the courts. If they will not come and take the birth certificate, then gently toss it across the bar into the well of the court. Special appearance means that you are not giving the court jurisdiction over you. Five. On a brass plaque somewhere in an obscure your location inside the hospital, probably under a stairwell. It says this hospital is a foundling hospital. Found lean hospital. So a mother, nine months pregnant, walks into a foundling hospital. She goes through a major medical procedure called childbirth where she's in pain and under duress. She's probably under the influence of painkillers of some type. You gotta be pretty tough to give birth. <laughs> I wouldn't want to do it. <laughs> anyway, she has that beautiful baby and all she's thinking about is getting home with it and leave it. But see the baby in history, throughout history, came out of the water, was tugged through the birth canal, was docked at the dock by the dock tender where a bill of lading was filled out and received on the cargo, where its soul was taken, its soul plates. 
the footprints of the baby. The placenta was taken. Okay. They took the baby's soul and they sent it out with a tug and it's presumed dead and lost at sea until it should return and claim its minor estate. No physician delivers a baby. Only a doctor does. Doctor is doc tender. The baby is a vessel, a ship. That's where the all caps name comes in. If you look at the names of ships, they're in all capital letters. Okay. No one disclosed the terms and conditions of the contract, yet you were handed a stack of papers to fill out and you were only told, and this was right out of the nurse's manual, this is just to register your baby with the state and to give it a name. And you fill out the paperwork and you name your baby and you sign as an informant. What is the legal definition of the word informant? Someone who gives someone else up to another, thereby giving the title and equity of your child to the state. This creates a doctrine called parents patre. So I should write that. It's Latin for state is your parent. State is the parent. Creates the doctrine of parents patre. Through this doctrine, that's how they have control over you and through your consent of being a citizen, a person, a resident. Three things you never want to be. I'm going to start with what law really is. Most of us think that we go into a courtroom and understand the difference between a court and a courtroom, that uh, the people who purport to use law really use words of art to make you believe, in fact, that law is uh, on the table when you walk into a courthouse or a courtroom, when in fact that's not true. And I would like to share with you tonight, regardless of your religious persuasion, what law really is. Law, and as Muslims would say, all law, is A-L-L -L space L-A-W, all law, all law. So for anyone who's of a Christian persuasion, don't be misled, and when you hear the term all law, all law is God, all right? That is also what we would say in lawful terms, a misnomer. All law is not God. God has no capacity and no standing to all law. Because God means governmental ordinance departments. There is no comparison. Now, who can use law? Law can only be used by people who are in their sovereign capacity. And I was, as I will share with you tonight, the majority of the people in the world, and I'm not going to get into all of the details about that, but the majority of the people in the world, 99% of them live in slavery today. So in 1863, via the Emancipation Proclamation, and I challenge you to go look in a law dictionary and look up the definition of emancipation and proclamation, and you will see that a proclamation is not a law. A proclamation is a public announcement by elected officials. It is not a law. So the Emancipation Proclamation of 1863 did not set any slaves free. What it did was standardize slavery, the United States being the model for the standardization of slavery, that all of the other nations around the world, as they reduced their people from their sovereign capacity and forced them to join nation states, then they were able to issue statute, codes, ordinances, resolutions on them. And a statute, as in a state statute of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, is not a law. It is corporate policy of the corporation that calls itself the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania Incorporated. All right? Now, a code is not a law. The United States codes, the code of the laws of the United States of America that are used in federal court and the Supreme Court are not law. They are what they say they are. They are codes ordinances and resolutions of a municipality of the city of Philadelphia, which is a private nonprofit corporation that calls itself the city of Philadelphia, an ordinance and a resolution, as in parking ordinances, they are not law. They are what they say they are. They are ordinances and they are resolutions, all right? And the reason they are not law is because the only people who can issue law are people who are acting in their sovereign capacity. And the people who sit in these seats as elected officials are not, in fact, in their sovereign capacity. They are in a corporate ward status, meaning that they are wards of the state. They are members of the corporation, which is a nonprofit, that calls itself the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. 
And as long as they have a birth certificate on record with the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, with that birth certificate being a contract, a birth certificate is a contract, and as long as you have a contract with the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania Incorporated, you belong to them, and that's what slavery really is, all right? So who can use law? If you are a member of a corporate ward state, if you are a member of a corporate ward nation that calls itself the United States of America, you are a citizen. Look in the law dictionary and look up the definition of citizen. A citizen is not a sovereign. A resident is not a sovereign. Therefore, if you use an address, which is a fictitious number associated with a designation issued by a corporate ward, right? then you become under the jurisdiction of those people who are also corporate wards, but who are also slaveholders, all right? So if you are operating in that capacity, law does not apply to you. If you are a resident of the city of Philadelphia, which is a private nonprofit corporation, and you say you are a resident of the city of Philadelphia, then the ordinances and the resolutions of that private nonprofit corporation apply to you. If you are a citizen of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania Incorporated, which is a private nonprofit corporation, then the statutes of that nonprofit corporation apply to you. If you are a citizen of the United States of America, which is a private nonprofit corporation, then the code of the laws, right, apply to you. But if you are a sovereign of the Moorish Empire, those ordinances, those resolutions, those codes, those statutes do not apply to you because you are not a member of the corporate ward state. It's as simple as that. And they understand the difference. This is why on their documents, they use words of art. They use the word label. They use the word person. They use the word address. All of these things that place you in their jurisdiction and you unknowingly fill out forms every day. And every time you fill out a form, you enter into a contract. I don't care what kind of form it is. It's a contract. A driver's license application is a contract. A social security application is a contract. When you call at the telephone company and you make a verbal contract over the telephone, this is why they can bill you. When you sign a deed, it is a contract. When you fill out a voter registration form, it is a contract. Does everybody understand that? Don't ever think. Every, anything that you put your signature on becomes a contract. All right? Now, the fact that you are not in your sovereign status means that you make a contract as a minor. They don't care. They know you are a minor because and, and to be other than a minor For everybody that's trying to monetize their birth certificate by first you're going to need your QSIP number. So let's look at the QSIP number and find out how much the bond is worth. First you're going to need to go to fidelity.com and sign in. Once you get there, you're going to hit like the little three bars up there on the side. When you after you hit that, you're going to go to news and research. After entering that news and research tab, you're going to hit quotes. Which will bring you to a page that looks like this. So you're going to go right here where it says enter symbol or company name. You're looking for your stock symbol in order to locate your QCIP number. So you're going to enter your birth certificate number right there. That might bring you to a page that looks like this. Enter it again inside of there. Okay, so there it goes. That's the stock symbol right there. That is the birth certificate number that I used. I blocked it out, so I'm not just putting information out like that. Now that we got the stock symbol, we're gonna go ahead over to the fun finder. We're gonna enter the stock symbol into the fun finder. As you can see, I'm using the same stock symbol and that's the same name and stuff that was on there same information so all of that will bring you to a page that looks like that now as you can see the QCIP number is over there this is how much the bond is on there for that 22.77 is 22 million that's how much it's worth so I zoomed in a little bit so you can see that the QCIP number is right there the QCIP number is going to be on the right side of the page this is the birth certificate that I used to locate the bond and as you can see, those are the same numbers that I use on Fidelity. You see the 676 at the end? Oh, and throughout the years, they made $50 billion off of that one bond alone.
banks are using your applications as a form of money, as a form of payment to open your accounts. Listen to this conversation that I'm having with a banker at Bank of America. Question really is, listen. is that the application would be considered a promissory note because it could be transferred to a third party. The application that you're signing. When you go in there and like, yo, I want to open up an account. They want you to do it online. Or they want you to fill out some piece of paper. You're getting a mortgage loan. Any application that you're signing. This is for an unsecured credit card. Listen. Listen to his answer. for Bank of America that is considered a promissory note and then that promissory note goes into a deposit account uh, de uh, sorry that promissory note goes into a deposit account and then if I ever happen to default you guys could use that promissory note to then uh, transfer or assign to some third party so that they could possibly collect on that right exactly yep oh okay well yep. thank you so much for that comprehension and I, I appreciate that thank no you problem. so much and I hope you have a fantastic day all right you too, sir. Take care. Call us back anytime. All right. All right. Thank you so much. All right. It is the ignorance of Americans to think that our national debt is based off of this and that this is the only form of payment that exists in America. To think that banks aren't using other mediums as forms of payments is completely and utterly ignorant. Money is not only this. Banks are using your applications, whether electronic, signature, or physical, to fund the deposit on the account. No bank can open an account without an application as a form of payment. Let me say that again. No bank can open an account without an application as a form of payment. I posted a video about the tax forms. Class 5 codes for a stating gift. Look at what I highlighted. Your 1099s. Pause and read. Pause and read. Pause and read. Peace, family. Here we have another discharge for a car. Here's the title, and here's the letter showing that everything was paid off. Now, what we did here was something different. We did not use a negotiable instrument, but we used the paperwork. Um, we used Title 15, um, 1666, and we created a billing error dispute. And through that billing error dispute, they have to show documentary evidence. We also use 15 U.S. Code 1640 Civil Liability. Now, I want you guys to go read the Consumer Credit Protection Act. In that act, it will speak about the contract being unconscionable. That means that it brings a shock to your conscience when you read the contract because it is not consistent with the law. Now, I'm arming you guys with things to combat these people with. So it's in your best interest to read. If you don't want to pay for the services, it's in your best interest to read. Reading will kill 99% of your problems. You might not understand that first, but it's important that you continuously read and study because day by day, you will start to understand more. Um, I know a lot of these words are words that we never seen or heard of before. And it took me a while, but it's important that you study and you read a lot if you want to get 
any type of remedy. Um, you have to come from your own mind and your own understanding. That is what standing on your square mean is your own set of principles. So every contract can be rescinded. And when you rescind a contract, it does not mean that you're canceling it, but you're renegotiating the terms to that contract. So, you know, these are just some things you need to learn. If you need our services, please reach out, send us an email. We will get back to you. Thank you. I hope you guys have a great day. Man, get in here, get in here, get in here. But before I start, if you'd like to donate for this great information that I'll be presenting to y'all, man, I appreciate it. You know I'm always bagging. You know I'm always bagging. But have you ever heard of the table of laws held unconstitutional? Oh, you didn't. I know you didn't. That's why I'm telling you this, because I love you. Did you know 95% of laws are unconstitutional? That's hidden from the public? Right here? Laws like seatbelt or use of the word motor vehicle or police is not in the constitution or your birth certificate has no nationality so on and so on like the land patents that's in black people's names that was held unconstitutional and cannot be sold supposed to hand down to their heirs man go go watch go look i guarantee you it's nine million laws is unconstitutional that they forced on us that you actually can sue them back. If you go to court, look under this list. Once you go under the list, scroll. Just scroll, pick one. And when you pick one, you'll find out very soon, clearly, that the United States has no constitutional jurisdiction over us. Maybe the immigrants, maybe Washington, D.C., but not over the whole other states. And this is facts. Go look. You'll thank me later. I guarantee you. Once you go in here, just scroll up, pick one. Just keep picking them. And you will understand very clearly that their whole objective is to wake up and to put us under the rest or under martial law that was held unconstitutional. Go look. You'll thank me later. But if you like it, just donate, please. I would draw a line, a horizontal line at the bottom of the circle straight across, and now what you have is the traditional upside down P account, which is nothing more than a ledger under accounting, where you have assets on the right and you have liabilities on the left. So when they go into the DTC and they go in answering questions, they are not asking questions as king, because the king always asks questions, so it's asking questions as king. So the one who asks the question is the king. And they're asking the questions whether or not you know what you're doing in there, and you're not going in as the king asking questions. They're asking the questions, and they're the king, and you're the debtor. And those people that are successful to get in there think they're going to be getting access to their accounts. And there's where the big benefit comes in. And if you fall into the, ba the trap by taking the benefit, you never even got out and you've got yourself in a bigger mess than what you got into because you are just more, nothing more than a better paid slave because they're going to give to you all the treasury securities, the treasury bills, the T-bills, and maybe even the gold certificates or whatever's in that account. They're going to give it all to you. And at that moment, what you do with it is going to determine whether or not you're going to be succeeding in completing what you thought you were starting out doing or whether you're going to never get out and you're going to increase the debt even farther and they're going to love you for it because if you take those certificates those t-bills and you spend them like money like it's they hope you will you're going to take the benefit which is the debt and you're going to spend it back into the debt system and thinking that you got access to your account and you didn't so all those debt titles on the left side we're going to draw inside that left side we're going to draw another smaller circle I'm going to put a capital T in there, and capital T stands for titles. And at the foot of that T, we're going to put a small D. The D stands for debt. 
So it's the titles to the debt on the left side. We're going to do another circle on the right side. We're going to put a capital T in there also. Now that's the titles. And at the foot of that T, we're going to put a little A. And the A stands for assets. So it's the titles to the assets. Now, if you take those titles to the debt on the debt side and you spend them, you're just going to create more debt, double debt, paying debt, and you can't pay debt with debt. It just keeps mounting up, and that's why they're loving you. And you're creating more problems than, than you realize. You're putting the final clinches on the whole collapse of this whole thing. But if you treat it as a trust and you take the title and you draw a, a line from the TD up to, now we're going to draw another circle at the top. And we're going to put SM in there. That's the straw man account. We're going to take and merge the titles. We're going to move the title, the TD, and we're going to draw an arrow to that SM. And we're going to move that title to the debt into that SM, that straw man account. And on the right-hand side, the TA, the title to the assets, which is going to be the same amount as the TD on the left. They're going to be equal. We're going to move that title. We're going to draw a line up from that TA up into that SM straw man account. Now what we've done is we've settled the accounts. In effect, we're closing it. You've got the assets equaling the, the debts. And what happens when you take a minus and a plus and bring it together? Well, it discharges on the public side and it sets off on the private side. You bring the account to zero. But here's the thing. One penny of real money, lawful money, on the private side will discharge all debts all fixing money on the liability side. So if I fell into the trap and used those titles to the debt as money, I never did collapse the trust. I never did terminate the trust. The trust still exists. But if I move both titles to the debt into the straw man and the titles to the assets, the straw man accounts terminates. The trust purpose has been fulfilled. There is no trust. And what happens when the trust is terminated? The trustee must wind it up. He winds up the trust and he terminates the trust. In other words, he has to disperse the funds. The real money, still being held in private, minus, say, one penny. So now, what we're going to do from the remainder, let's back up a little bit. We're going to, after we gave the order for the settlement, we're going to give an order for the discharge on the public side. We're going to give an order for the set-off on the private side. And we're going to give an order to set up a new trust on a private side. And once that straw man account is closed, the remainder from that account is going to be transferred into the new trust. And that new trust, you're going to get a whole total different kind of credentials for. The straw man account with his capital names, with all the accounts associated with him, are eliminated. They're gone. They're terminated, period. All your electric bill accounts and everything in that way, will no longer exist, but you're going to form a new trust, another account, and you're going to have the remainder of that asset being put into that, and that's going to remain on the private side. Then you're going to come back over and you're going to order a new trust to be set up on the public side, an LLC, say, for example. And you're going to order the treasury to do the trade or whatever they're going to do to generate the interest held on the property or the assets held in private. And to deposit that interest, and that LLC on the public side, and you will live forever on the interest that was generated from that. And as long as you just use that interest to purchase goods and service that the goods and service that you purchase are consumed by the straw or the uh, real man held in private, as long as you don't conduct a business with that account, that new LLC, you no, won't be commingling your funds again, and you won't be creating any new debt. So in effect, you've taken care of the war debt, taken care of all past debts, and you've paid all present, and you've paid all future debts that may be in the future, and you've discharged them on the public side and set them off on the private side. And the remainder was transferred into this new account on the private side, which was generating interest on a new LLC on the public side, and that interest was placed into that, and you will write checks like that, and nobody will be the wiser. And it is not taxable because it's foreign source. And you will be given the credentials to identify this new trust entity, and you'll become whoever. And you'll be able to travel like you were before, probably with more freedom than you had before under today's terms. As long as we do due process and notify all parties, and they will never answer back because they never have. 
because if they did, they'd be acknowledging the debt themselves and they would stop the prescription. So we have to go and ask questions because the one asking questions as king is king. And the questions I want to be asking are, do you have all the necessary forms in your possession to close and settle this account? If they say yes, well then, you've already got the order for the settlement, then close and settle it. If they say no, then I would give them an order to give me the forms that I need to complete the information so you can close and settle the accounts. So that also explains the reasons why some of these 1099 OIDs that were withholding, they put on the withholding there and taxed it back to the principal. And as soon as they got it back to the principal, the IRS seized the funds or locked up the account because the, the account the IRS accountants couldn't give the disbursement to the beneficiaries who were debtors because as soon as the assets were transferred to them, the creditors would jump all on them. So what they had to do is they had to seize the assets and apply it to the debt. And that's why you didn't get any funds. And until we pay the past war debts, all the past debts, present debts,